welcome. Almost the end of the conference. I hope you all had a great week. Uh, thanks for joining. Hopefully this should be fun. Um, the idea is to talk about um, something I did a couple of years back, actually, uh, beginning of the pandemic, but it's been a, lo a long journey, and I want to share a bit of, about uh, this journey, uh, how I basically ended up building some kind of artificial nose using really low-cost, uh, low-tech uh, kind of technology, initially starting with Arduino, um, and that was a great experience, and then I ended up uh, eventually migrating to Zephyr, and that was even better. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Benjamin. I'm a developer advocate for the Zephyr project, and I'm French, so I do like baking, among other things. I do like uh, yummy food, um, and I've been trying to perfect my bread recipe for the past, probably past 30 years, actually, and I'm still not incredibly happy about um, how the bread turns out. It's never crispy enough. It's never, like, risen enough. Um, it's hard. I mean, some of you might be um, uh, recognizing what I'm, uh, what I'm uh, telling here. So back in I remember like 2019 or 2020, when was the first few months of the pandemic, uh, everyone stuck at home. Um, I was like, okay, this might be a good opportunity, just like pretty much uh, billions of people in the world, this might be a great opportunity to bake even more bread and try to improve uh, my recipe. And I was like, hey, this is maybe finally uh, an excuse for me to do some um, machine learning. I'm just like, probably pretty much everyone in the room. I'm supposed to be a software engineer by training, except that I'm really bad at all things math. Uh, and whenever I would open a book uh, where it's like, oh yeah, neural networks, it's easy. Look at those handwritten digits. We're gonna do like matrix like feature extraction, layers, whatever. It was just, I couldn't really uh, understand how to make anything useful out of what the book is, was trying to tell me, um, except that, well, at that time, and now you're hearing that more and more, and Jordan was talking about it yesterday, and there's this notion of tiny ML, which by the way, is that's not the name of a product, uh, it's not, it's, it's just the, the, the name of um, an approach, which is taking all things machine learning and neural networks and whatnot, and making it fit and run on small um, devices, with like the main uh, idea being, I mean, you want it to be efficient when it comes to processing power, but maybe even more importantly, in terms of um, energy, like you want to build devices that are battery powered and that are smarter. And I was like, okay, it looks like this would be the kind of thing that I would run on those kind of Arduino devices that I'm very familiar with. And maybe this will be a way to, rather than looking at bitmaps and like, pixels in uh, something like quite abstract, like the handwritten digits, maybe this will be a way for me to look at more like tangible things, quantities, and correlate things like, I, like, like my intuition was telling me, things like, okay, I have a sourdough starter, I'm sort of like eyeballing it, I'm smelling it to figure out whether it looks like it's um, ripe and, 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 uh, and perfectly fermented or not maybe the machine would, do, would be able to do the same, right? And, and, and I would basically smell using uh, gas sensors, smell the sourdough starter, bake the bread, figure out whether the bread is like a one out of 10, eight out of 10 kind of bread, and then rinse and repeat and have some kind of like training material. And like, maybe that was finally my, my way to, to, to dive into, um, into TinyAML. And uh, thanks to, again, Arduino and like the super awesome ecosystem of libraries for like sensor drivers and like uh, graphical user interfaces and whatnot and other tools out there. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Edge Impulse. It's by no way a plug of uh, their solution, but it's basically tooling on top of TensorFlow Lite and like a really nice basically web interface where you start feeding your data and it's like very visual and you start li labeling your data sets. You still know nothing about the math behind it, but at least you're able to train a model uh, and do something useful in the form of just spitting out an Arduino uh, library uh, um, that you can uh, easily reuse. And I ended up building, in literally a couple hours, minus the 
fancy enclosure uh, that came later, but literally hours, just like, I mean, the Arduino way, frankly, I put some pieces together and I was able to smell a few things. So didn't start with bread actually, because it would have taken, I guess, many, many hours or days to get enough training. I rather basically took what I had in my shelves, spirit and coffee and whatnot, smelled using a gas sensor, and we will talk about, uh, about it a, a little more um, in, in, in a while, smelled and captured some, some data and used that for basically uh, training a model that could then recognize things. Uh, that was fun, and that was like, I'm by no means sort of like trying to brag when saying it took me only a couple hours. It's actually quite the opposite. Like I really felt that I had, well, finally learned a few things about TinyML, but surely many people before me would have done the same. Like it was a crappy, quite frankly, uh, sensor, a very simple model. And sure, I was smelling things, but yeah, that was, that's what ML does. But people were like, I, when I started to talk about it on Twitter and social media and whatnot, people were like really impressed. Maybe I guess the funny enclosure uh, helped a bit. I think I have it in my bag actually. Uh, do I? Yeah, whatever. Funny. So I also learned Blender in the process. That was also a nice, um, a nice excuse. Uh, but yeah, people were all about it. It ended up making the cover of Make Magazine. That kind of really didn't help my uh, imposter syndrome there because I really felt like it was something, uh, not, not if not trivial, at least um, nothing special. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it inspired people. And I think there's a lesson there in terms of even before thinking tiny ML. We are all like more or less embedded developers, IoT developers, however you want, you want to call it. What I've realized, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's still uh, the case today, many people, including experts of the domain, like um, chemists and people from the uh, um, uh, food industry, etc., which I thought would know that it's possible to smell things or to measure gas concentrations using sensors, they didn't even know that, so let alone hooking up tiny ml into that people when they think sensors i think they th they think like temperature humidity the kind of thing that maybe they experience in their households but there's many many more physical things that can be measured and potentially fed into a ai algorithm that i think the sort of the industry uh, at large doesn't necessarily know about so that that's one um and yeah it, it inspired people so that that was pretty cool um so it ended up being published in, in Make Magazine. There was this, um, actually, I only realized a few minutes ago, uh, this um, sweater that I'm wearing uh, from, um, uh, from um, Pasadena um, University. Um, yeah, there's this kid out of, uh, out of Los Angeles. He found the magazine. He was really sick when he was, I think, eight years old, pretty much almost died. And turns out that doctors could never diagnose the fact that he had fungal pneumonia because uh, like, I mean, it's kind of a hard uh, d a disease to diagnose uh, only through like x-rays, maybe you can, you can spot it. But now that it, he, he, he grew up, there's been some like uh, scientific research around the topic. It turns out that apparently you can smell the markers of the disease in someone's breath, like some uh, yeah, from essentially, if you smell like lemon and I don't know what was the, the other kind of like um, essential marker, that, that could be a good sign. So he did something like pretty amazing with like an artificial respirator, et cetera, to train the data. He did that, except that he's 13 years old, is like obviously brilliant, but he's no programmer. And the only code he had access to was my crappy Saturday afternoon Arduino 2000 lines of code a super loop. And so I felt kind of like really bad. And we will talk about uh, more about why that eventually sort of uh, led me to uh, uh, convert to Zephyr and try and do something more, um, um, yeah, slightly more uh, future proof, let's say. Uh, quick uh, side note on, because uh, again, I said that there's this whole thing of people not necessarily being super familiar with all the ways we can sense uh, the world around us. Uh, in case you're interested, and I'm no um, chemist or electrochemist, but basically uh, the gas sensor that I'm using for the, for the project 
is uh, effectively a four in one, like those four uh, pieces of uh, moss effectively that you see on, on the PCB. They all react to, um, one reacts uh, to volatile organic compounds, the other to um, alcohol, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. And the way it works is that there's uh, like, they're being heated up uh, and due to the, to the like, like actually heat it up really, really uh, warm, uh, which means also that you have lots of power. Uh, it draws a lot of, of, of current, but uh, when it's, it gets really, really hot, um, it starts reacting with the chemical compounds in the air and there's some kind of like uh, redox um, uh, reaction happening. And so you can measure basically a change in resistance, which that of course uh, MCUs are um, uh, pretty good at. And so say you have 10 parts per million of, of VOCs, maybe your, uh, your sensor will register at 100 ohms and you have 10 times more, the resistance will be twi twice as big, whatever. This is where, like when, I mean, I knew that I wanted to, to sense and smell um, data and my intuition really, and this is where also, by the way, the tools like Edge Impulse, and I'm, I'm sure there's many others, this is where I was able to sort of finally bridge this um, uh, gap I was having when reading the books. They were like, oh yeah, a handwritten digit, it's easy. It's 20 by 20 pixel. And you have like matrices. Yeah, no, I don't care about matrices. I'd rather like sort of see and feel the data. And so if I were to smell, say, whiskey um, here, uh, I could look at the data and be like, oh yeah, okay, I know. If I were to write this as a like as actual code, I would probably figure out something like if nitrogen dioxide is going up in a steady way, if carbon monoxide is kind of flat but kind of fluctuating as well. Uh, this is whiskey. And so this, among other things, allowed me to finally, I guess, understand things like feature extraction. In this case, it's really basic statistics, looking at things like on a given time window, what's the minimum, the maximum, the standard deviation, the average of each and every uh, quantity, because those are going to be the sort of like the, the very, like the bare minimum uh, kind of inputs that I want to feed into my uh, algorithm which effectively is like just, I need to solve an equation where if, I'm, if I feed you with the average level of VOCs, the maximum level of VOCs, et cetera, and I tell you that this is effectively ambient air or whiskey, please like remember that uh, so that later on, like, I mean, training a model basically. So um, yeah, and then the model, by the way, is really like that. Like there's no like convolution or no like, um, there's not much, it's, and you could do like basic clustering probably um, at the end of the day, but uh, yeah, that's, that's it. And so that was pretty fun to build. Um, Arduino, again, I, I told you like it was really, really fun or, or was it? Cause there's actually a lot of things that, that's going on in there. Just like if you've been playing with Arduinos, I think again, you know what I'm talking about. You keep adding and adding stuff and like it does a lot of things. It, um, there's a hardware interaction with the sensors, obviously. There is a fan that can draw some, like the smells into the, into the contraption. Uh, graphical user interface, ideally uh, you make it like battery powered, uh, connecting to the Wi-Fi. We're gonna talk about some of the potentially IoT use cases be, um, behind things like a, an artificial nose. But if you start building that in a, uh, a la Arduino, then you might be in trouble because You've been training a model where you, um, you have like training data, which is effectively in my case, only like sampling gas sensor data at 10 Hertz for a couple seconds. That's actually enough to capture the minimum uh, average, maximum, et cetera, I was uh, referring to uh, earlier, which effectively represents the fingerprint, if you will, of a smell. But like the, the fact that the data is acquired at exactly 10 Hertz, that's actually quite important. Otherwise you get your model uh, giving you completely bogus uh, outputs. So in the loop, one thing that I do is acquiring the sensor data. That's pretty fast uh, and like I can do that. I can feed it to TensorFlow Lite for uh, microcontrollers to actually run my inference. For what it's worth, that's also really fast. Like it only takes like really a couple milliseconds on the uh, 200 megahertz uh, Atmel uh, Cortex M4, I think, uh, chip, M4F. So that's still fast. Then there might be some kind of uh, um, UI interactions. There's a UI that I need to refresh, which again, hopefully, 
takes, I don't know, uh, tens of milliseconds. But then I, I might actually want to send data to a server, and that might take a long time, and then my loop is all effed up, and I, uh, I'm not able to sample the data at 10 hertz anymore, which, I mean, yeah, there, there's probably a way to still do that in a kind of uh, a super loop and like have some kind of uh, uh, basic scheduler uh, and still stick to the, the Arduino way. But uh, what I realized is that, I mean, I'd rather migrate uh, my code to, uh, to Zephyr. Actually, I should have removed the slide that introduces Zephyr. I don't think it, it requires an introduction, but yeah, I want to sort of walk you through um, some of the things, some of the concepts, subsystems, in, in Zephyr that are uh, that actually proved uh, quite um, useful because uh, that that makes the, the code and the application in general so much um, um, yeah fun actually to to, to work with um, things like uh, sensor data acquisition like it's something that can now uh, happen in a completely dedicated thread and it can make sure that yes it's going to run at exactly 10 Hertz uh, I can have also an abstraction of the um, like the underlying actual sensor that I'm using, the only thing my model cares about is reading gas uh, concentrations. It doesn't really matter whether it's uh, a Bosch sensor or whether it's the sensor from Seed Studio that I've been using initially. So that's pretty uh, nice. It also makes it, like the sensor subsystem, um, makes it quite easy to simulate the data, uh, emulate or simulate however, however you want to call it, which can be, um, can be useful. There's power management integrated in it, uh, like uh, Jordan, again, I guess, mentioned, uh, among others, uh, today. Um, this one has a small caveat, which is that the technology uh, for the gas sensors require, requires, like I mentioned, uh, for the sensor to be really, really warm. Um, so not only does it draw a lot of current, but you're kind of stuck with it because it takes a long time to stabilize. So it's not like you can go to sleep, turn off the sensor, and then turn it on and Get a, reading, re get a reading in the next second or so, you need to wait minutes uh, usually for the readings to stabilize. So in theory, you could hook up power management, but it's, um, it, it can be tricky. Um, yeah, and then feeding the data to TensorFlow Lite. So a couple of things to say there. One is TensorFlow Lite for micros is like already available in Zephyr as a module. So like pooling it uh, in, in your system, getting uh, automatically um, CMC's DSP and CMC's and then potentially to kick in uh, that that's there uh, so you have like a, a great acceleration etc and in my uh, case one one thing that also was quite interesting was that I'm by no means a great embedded developer but I'd like to think that I know how to write apps in general and so I want to write my artificial nodes just like I would be writing like a regular, I don't know, web application or something like at a really high level, right? I don't really care about the, the really low level, the really low level stuff. So in my head, like I want to be able to do something like sensor task, sensor thread does its stuff and makes the data available to the rest of the system. Similarly, the inference thread, which should hopefully run with a much lower priority and like be uh, when when it can uh, does the same subscribes to any hypothetical sensor readings and then uh, posts publishes uh, whatever um, the the results and then there's a GUI that subscribes maybe to both that sh um, um, needs to visualize and display sensor data as well as the inference results. And so I've been basically uh, building on top of uh, Zbus for, um, for doing just that. And so then there's the GUI that comes into play. Uh, it was really, really ugly in the past with the Arduino version uh, using basically manipulating pixels almost uh, di directly with some kind of abstraction. But it, I mean, it's really fun initially, but then when you want to look, when, when you want to make something look pretty and don't like have don't uh, not eat up lots of memory, etc. Then it's not fun anymore. So there is uh, a really good integration in Zephyr for the LVGL uh, graphical toolkit, graphical framework. Uh, there's we have a really like super uh, passionate and uh, productive maintainer uh, uh, there who really keeps track of the upstream LVGL project. So you have uh, yeah basically the the same LVGL uh, 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 as everyone else, which basically allows you again to my point of myself being more an app developer, I write a GUI using like widgets and like uh, 
callbacks on my buttons, etc. My buttons, they can actually be buttons as per the Zephyr input subsystem or the touch screen is effectively like, as long as I have a, a, a touch screen driver and I've hooked it up properly in my device tree, then I can start using it in my GUI. And when I start like dragging sliders around, etc., it will just work. Memory management, similarly, uh, you can like leverage um, uh, the memory attributes and whatnot to, um, to, do, to really fine tune the way memory is gonna be managed. And one thing that's also really, really cool, it's not necessarily like LVGL specific, frankly, uh, it's more about the native simulator infrastructure that we have in Zephyr on top of your like Linux box, your Linux uh, desktop machine, you can actually run your app, potentially with simulated sensors, like I mentioned before, and simulated display as well. Like the screenshot you have here is the same app that's running on my actual device here, uh, except that it's on my, uh, on my desktop. So like the sort of the round trip time for prototyping, troubleshooting is way uh, faster that way. And uh, putting all the pieces together, um, um, ML inference, ZBus, display, uh, like LVGL display, literally the code, like again, the app code looks a bit like this. Like I have, uh, uh, I'm using like the ZBus macro that allows me to, uh, to listen to, uh, to particular messages. And as soon as uh, such a message is being uh, posted, then I get it and do whatever I want with it, which in my case would be uh, calling whatever LVGL API allows me to create a fancy GUI, displaying a label, uh, feeding data into a chart, uh, you name it. And so we can actually probably see that in action now. Uh, running the demo on an M5 stack ESP32 device. So obviously, I mean, you know that, but it's good to say it out loud. The app is very portable. So I have uh, this guy that I mentioned before, like originally the Wii terminal that I used, uh, it's a um, SAMD51 Cortex M4F. Same app, no, nothing um, needs to be changed. Um, and yeah, we have, so we have a chart. You might not see it all that well, but all the horizontal lines, those are like the four channels, the four gas sensors. And it says that it's reading ambient noise, uh, ambient air, not ambient noise, uh, right now. And the sensor is right here. And I have a smelly thing right here. Let's figure out what it is. Should work except I, I might not have enough hands to do it properly, but there we go, ambient. There we go. Lemon, it says that it's lemon. We see the, so oh, yeah, there we go. It's really kicking in. So you can also tell that the sensor is not that sensitive, not that reactive, that's just the technology. It's like, 20 bucks worth of sensors. Uh, and by the way, I think like the Bosch sensor I mentioned before, it's more like around four bucks. So there's, I mean, different technology, but um, yeah, it says that it's lemon and the gauge is saying the sort of the confidence level. So it's sort of oscillating. Um, yeah, I guess now it's, it's 80% sure it's ambient. I mean, I, you get the idea. I, I, I haven't retrained the, uh, the model recently, so it might be that the sensor is full of finger grease. It might be that the, the conditions here um, are slightly different, but the, the model that I used is really literally just minutes worth of data. So obviously um, it can probably be fine tuned. Um, one thing that's also part of, and was part of the initial uh, proof of concept, I guess you could say, is trying to um, demonstrate that beyond the fun uh, or silly aspect of the of the this whole project. There's also this idea of hey, it might actually be a very valid use case for IoT uh, in the form of what if I were to stick this kind of device in the restrooms of a facility, office buildings, uh, to figure out when the air starts smelling not so nice, to send people and clean, right? And you don't want to send someone twice a day or like twice a week, whatever, to a place that doesn't necessarily require that much cleaning, right? I mean, offices, maybe uh, people use, use uh, them less uh, post-COVID. And so having a device that you stick, uh, like a wireless device, you stick in the ceiling of the, of the restrooms, 
and post data to an IoT server, that might actually be a very valid use case. Um, and yeah, we, we can talk about, it can go both, both ways actually, posting data, but potentially also pushing updates to, uh, to the model, uh, why not? So yeah, I mean, obviously Zephyr has a great uh, network connectivity stack. Uh, part of the uh, migration uh, process for me, and everything's on GitHub by the way, uh, was to, uh, use the, um, to use MQTT to post data, like whenever there was a new inference result uh, that's different from the previous one, then you publish to a, um, to a server, and that's something that could be used, again, for this kind of use case that I was uh, mentioning. And then you start tapping into uh, things like the world digital twins buzzword, which in fact might actually be more than just a buzzword. If you think about a company that's sort of specialized in cleaning buildings and like doing maintenance work, etc., they probably already have like a really rich information system where they manage like all their facilities, they manage the, the schedules of their employees, you name it, like the billing, the invoicing of the customers. So you have this like uh, existing um, database, but what if you start like augmenting it, uh, like hopefully you, you code that, right? Like the, uh, the, you have devices maybe that are part of also of this same sort of knowledge graph, if you will. So let's say we have an artificial nose device and as part of the provisioning process, whoever is going to install the device in the, fl the third floor of Tribune Tower in Chicago, they will effectively make this association which allows like it's basic uh, database uh, stuff, if you will, but it's still worth again saying it out loud, I think. As soon as such a device starts sending information, like very raw information, just like it smells, then you can do whatever in your, in your system, right? And like query the system to be like, oh, who is responsible for cleaning floor three of this particular building today? Oh, it's, it's John. Oh, but he's on holiday today. So it's actually Jane that we need to text or send an email to like send them on site. So that's... Um, that's one of the things that, uh, that, that uh, this whole project, I guess, or like a use case uh, enables. And then there's more, of course, that I was happy to be able to use in, in the, as part of the migration process, things that I didn't have when using the, I guess, the Arduino way, all the configurability, like if I run uh, the, uh, the device on, uh, the, sorry, the application on a device that has a small screen, like it's really, really easy to make my GUI code adapt accordingly. Like maybe I want to show a graph. If I, I'm running on a super tiny display, I will only show the, like the, the smell kind of thing. And that's something that you can do like just out of the box. You have kconfigs that expose uh, and give you access to the screen resolution, the, whether you have network connectivity and whatnot. Some of you know that, of course. Um, testing framework, like it's actually quite nice to be able to do especially in this context where I'm starting and thinking about decoupling really all my tasks and, and processes. I'm doing sensing on one hand, uh, ML inferencing on the other, and then also the GUI. Like this is really independent. Zbus in the, in, the, in, the, in the middle. Testing that is actually way, uh, way simpler and especially with things like Twister, et cetera. Taps also into the wall uh, CI uh, story, like all the, anytime I of course do a push on, on the project, I can, check against all the devices um, and the boards that I'm targeting. So that's pretty cool. And what I find even cooler, although I didn't get a chance just yet, is Zephyr keeps adding stuff that's very relevant uh, to this project and to hopefully many more. But you've heard about, uh, so I was, say, I was saying LLX until today, but I'll start saying LX. Uh, dynamic extensions. Uh, the, the model, the AI model uh, that's, that runs the, um, the application today, as of today, it smells um, good air and nasty air. It turns out that maybe in a couple of years, uh, and apparently like that's what some scientific research uh, seems to say, there might be ways to smell COVID in the air. So maybe I will be able with the same hardware to have a better model that's able to spot that using, L, using LEXT. I could theoretically, over the internet, push it over, um, over the wire or the, over, over the air to, um, to update the model on the fly. I could add geolocation to the mix. I could add 
more types of displays, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, um, that's pretty cool. Um, everything, like I said, is open source on GitHub, including the 3D enclosure, uh, should you want to print it. Uh, originally, I thought um, it was a bad design, but apparently many people around the world have been printing it, so um, I guess it works. The actual Zephyr-based project is uh, this particular URL. Uh, the other one would have been the legacy project if you want to get the parts. I'm not getting anything out of that. I guess I should, because um, I think they've been selling quite a few. But uh, uh, among others, uh, see it as like a, a skew, uh, like one click on their website, you will get the Wii terminal, the gas sensor, the baguette. No, I don't think the baguette comes with it. Um, and yeah, that's it. I think that's what I had, frankly. Um, we have time for questions, so I hope you have some. There's one here. Great talk. I really liked it. Um, so. Did you manage to apply your digital nose to improve your baking? I should have a slide about that because that's actually the first question that everyone asks. I never, I moved on. Like I, I figured I had, I had, I had a lot of, lot of fun with the, the whole thing. But the thing is, and I, uh, well, I actually kind of used to have a slide about that. The thing is back in May of, again, I think it's 2020, right? Uh, whatever, really early in the pandemic, there wasn't even flour on the like shelves in the store. so. I would have needed to bake dozens and dozens of baguettes, right, to train the model and eat the bread, which might have been also a problem too. But uh, so yeah, it was way much easier to literally spend minutes smelling whiskey and coffee and whatever I had. Uh, and for what it's worth, like with a very simple model, very crappy sensor, my initial test, like as part of this first Saturday afternoon, was with booze, like I, I think I mentioned. And yeah, like different kinds of whiskeys it would be able to pick up the difference, like a really peated whiskey versus a slightly less peated one versus vodka and rum and yet another rum, I think, like f those five spirits, including like two rum, two, two whiskey, it, it worked. So that's, um, but yeah, no bread, never tr actually tried. So now you are an alcoholic. Yeah. <laughs> I also have one more question. No, like, the thing is that I didn't need to, to drink. <laughs> As opposed to the bread, I might have been become a celiac or whatever. Uh, I was also wondering what your data collection process was to build up a data set to train your model. Yeah, so and, and so that's actually a feature that's still uh, in there, uh, also the, that I ported from the Arduino um, uh, legacy app. So there's this edge impulse thing, but it will be applicable to other sort of workflows that makes it really easy to. Um, so the way it works is that. I build the app with sort of a flag on which, when it's on, the uh, device would dump sensor data to the UART in a CSV-like format. And then uh, the Edge Impulse thingy has a, de a daemon that runs on your uh, machine that forwards the data to the cloud. But it, again, it doesn't have to rely on the cloud. But, and it makes it really, really easy to feed data in somewhere, label it, and so you're, you can be like, Okay, I want to capture two minutes worth of data, so it starts listening to the, this stream of, of sensor data. Then you label it, you visualize it. Uh, I think I can probably pull it up just like real quick um, right here. You, ca you can visualize it. It suggests you some uh, basic uh, DSP slash uh, signal, uh, yeah, slash statistics blocks that you might want to use to uh, do the initial feature extraction. And then, uh, and then you're good to go. Like it's, um, yeah, so let's see. So that's training data. So exactly like I said, like I, I click, I'm like, okay, I wanna capture 30 seconds worth of data that I know, oh, I'm not sharing, sorry. Should have told me. All right, I'm not duplicating the screen, so it might be a challenge. Yeah, whatever, yeah, that's enough. Uh, the, um, yeah, the, so those are all the, uh, the captured samples. So 30 seconds of whiskey on May uh, the 7th of 2021, blah, 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 blah. And then uh, that, uh, the, the tool automatically suggests some uh, feature extraction uh, things that would work well for time series data. Uh, so 
Would you like to try to average the data on the two, two seconds window? Would you like to try to blah, blah, blah? And then once you have that, it does kind of the same process for suggesting some very basic, like fully connected uh, um, neural networks, and then you're good to go. And then, like I said, once, you, once you're done with it, you realize that maybe there's just really little actual, um, uh, very few features that actually contribute to the results so few that maybe you could actually do the whole thing with just like an if, like if uh, VOC is above this threshold, it's always coffee sort of thing. But uh, it also works with the neural network. And if you do all the optimizations, it's not necessarily gonna be more uh, costly in terms of RAM processing power, et cetera. So that was my long answer, I guess. Hello. Uh, what will be the difference uh, between this artificial nose and then um, air quality sensor? Because I know those are also using uh, gas sensors. Yeah. Or uh, so maybe you can yeah. use them at a large so scale, like for air yeah, sensors. Yeah, from what I know about air quality sensors, um, there's an aspect to them which is um, they look also at uh, particulate matter uh, concentration. But one thing that I uh, often tend to mention with I mean, I call it an artificial nose. It's by no means like anywhere close to a human or uh, a dog nose. Um, but it's, I mean, it's a device that smells, but in fact, it, it could use whatever kind of sensors. Potentially, um, just like we do sensor fusion with uh, accelerometers and gyros, etc., we could think of doing the same. Um, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, if you want to build a device that makes up the difference between orange juice, water, and wine, if you can afford or if you have access to a color sensor, maybe you can, you can feed that also in the system, right? And so, and then you have concentration of VOC, air quality, humidity, color, you feed all of that into your like training workflow. And then as part of the training, the, you will realize that, well, you know what? Only the color input is, is required, right? So, um, yeah. Anthropomorphism is something that we tend to do maybe too much of uh, for those kind of applications, I think. And uh, yeah, it's not because it's a nose that it has to use gas sensors, I guess is what I'm saying. Any other questions? No, I have a question. So what's the next step? Test sensor? What, 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 what what's sensor? the next step after the smell? Test? What about test? Do you have any idea? Did you think about something else to, to take it beyond just smelling? Uh, beyond just smelling? No, I, don't, I, I would love... So, a couple of things. I, well, I would love for that to help. Uh, and we were, I was having discussions with folks around accessibility. Uh, there's lots, lots and lots of people who suffer from anosmia. So, we lost the sense of smell during COVID or for like, they've had a really bad cold and they lost their sense of smell forever. So uh, putting the device in a fridge to uh, figure out when the food gets spoiled. Like I actually had someone uh, at, uh, somewhere I w where I was uh, sort of demonstrating this device came to me and was like, last week I kind of almost died because I ate, like I don't have the sense of smell. I ate, I ate some ham or eggs or whatever. I kind of, I wasn't sure, but I ate them anyway and then I, was really, really uh, sick. So there's uh, that uh, as part of the what's next. Like it would be great for someone to pick, to pick it up. It might require better sensors. It might, re it might require the sensor fusion thing that I was referring to. Maybe um, that could help uh, that. And also uh, what I would like to see is just like we have all those data sets for training uh, like face, fa facial recognition algorithms and like image video recognitions all those labeled data sets for uh, yeah, images. I don't think we have, I mean, I know we don't have the same for smells. And so yeah. at some point, ideally in open source, it would be great to, to have that. Like there's, it comes with tons of challenges regarding how do you even represent a smell in the first place. Um, but yeah. Okay. Thank you, Benjamin. And thanks. Yeah, see you around. Yeah.